Hi, welcome to Detours Understanding Acquired Brain Injury, and specifically this is part of our ongoing series, um, Essentials of Acquired Brain Injury, and we're going to be talking about brain tumors and neoplasms and how they cause acquired brain injury. Um, so in order to discuss brain tumors, we first of all need to understand what a what cancer is. Now, cancer is essentially malfunction of the genes the, inside the nucleus of a cell that control reproduction of the cell and control its inhibition of reproduction. Cells, um, their uh, mechanism of asexual reproduction, how they divide and how they determine what they're going to be uh, is determined by their genes, the genes in the nucleus. The main purpose of uh, the genes in the cell is to uh, give instructions for what the cell is supposed to do, be, and how it is supposed to divide. Um, the thing is that within the cell, um, sometimes things go wrong with these control mechanisms. Um, and when these things, when these uh, genes that give these instructions malfunction um, due to inherited bad genes, think of it as like an error in the blueprints, which can be inherited from family members. And it's not always classic Mendelian genetics. Those of you who remember biology, where you were taught about, you know, the, draw the big X and the little X for recessive traits or, you know, two big X's, whatever. You remember the Punnett squares if you took bio or something like that. Um, it's not always classic Mendelian genetics. There can be other inheritance patterns, which are more difficult to, uh, you know, trace, but you can inherit in other ways. But things such as exposure to radiation or, and I'm not talking about your cell phone here, so no, we're not talking about, um, about conspiracy theory type stuff. Um, I'm talking about x-rays, gamma rays, ionizing radiation, which literally changes the way that genes are read by the cell when it's transcribing them for replication into proteins for dividing or as it's in the process of producing proteins. Uh, exposure to certain chemicals. We talked about toxic encephalopathy, um, chemical encephalopathy, things like that. Exposure to certain chemicals at work, things like that. Viruses, certain viruses can change how the, how the mechanisms inside of cells are read. Um, epigenetic factors, stressors in the environment can cause um, abnormal growth of cells. Um, the, the the list is is big of things like that emotional too much uh, cortisol um, traumatic brain injury can increase one's likelihood uh, both by an interplay between cortisol and other stress hormones plus um, inflammatory factors and the physical damage may cause the genes which are on or off to be misread um, so. It, this is a really complicated area of study. A lot of people say, oh, well, there's a cure for cancer. Let's be blunt about this. There's no cure for cancer because cancer is not a single thing. Your cells can malfunction in a myriad of ways due to a myriad of causes. Each person's gene profile is unique. And therefore, the treatments for cancer are different for each individual. So when we get into treatments, we'll have to talk about some of the basics of how these kind of treatments vary. Okay. But the fact of the matter remains, there is no single cure because cancer isn't a single disease. It's hundreds of them, thousands. And since each person's genes are unique, you will need to completely eradicate it potentially to at least cure it in those ways, a unique cure for each individual. Um, and so we need to bear in mind, there's no like magic pill out there that makes it go away. Oh, I wish that were true, but it, there just isn't, um, because of the complexity of genetics. 
and the fact that each one of us has a set of our own genes. So let's just jump into this and start talking about brain tumors, neoplasms. Neo meaning new, plasm meaning, you know, growth, um, organic substance. But we'll just call them brain tumors throughout. Um, so first of all, dividing up brain tumors for where you will find them, where you'll locate them. Um, you can find them either as primary, which means they originate. The brain tumor originates within the skull, as in within the brain tissue. Um, or they're metastatic in nature. And what that means is that um, the brain tumor originates elsewhere and spreads into the tissue into the brain. Now, it's very difficult to get past the blood-brain barrier, but certain types of cancer do. Breast cancer is one of the most common. Lung cancer is fairly common for that. Um, certain types of leukemia, that's fairly common um, and able to get through. Um, so there are a couple different uh, kinds of metastatic cancer that can get into your brain. Bone cancer can do that too. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that a little later. Um, so basically brain tumors just then is a growth of malfunctioning cells, abnormal cells inside the skull cavity. And also to keep in mind, as far as brain tumors, there are, um, benign or malignant. Now malignant are cancerous. Um, we'll, we'll touch on what it means to be malignant in a moment. And benign does not mean it isn't harmful. Benign just means that it isn't as aggressive in growth. So benign tumors in the brain can still kill. They're still dangerous. They still need to be removed. Um, but how they're treated, how they're handled, how they express themselves may be different from the more aggressive malignant type. And if they're primary malignant, there, we're talking more about a kind of brain tumor that is, um, starts in the brain because it's primary. That's the source. That is the site. It's within the skull. It's in, in the brain, but it's, but it is also aggressive. It's less likely to spread out of the, out of the skull. It's less likely to get into your, into your lungs, your liver or whatever else, but it's moving fast. And so it's got to be acted upon quickly. Um, versus primary benign, which is less likely to be fast moving. Um, you have a little more time. Okay. And then there's malignant metastatic cancer, which comes from elsewhere in the body and is fast moving and spreads. Okay. So, um, signs and symptoms of brain tumors do vary depending on where they are, how quickly they've spread. Usually the first signs and symptoms include things like severe headaches, that's one of the big ones, is a persistent severe headache. Um, another sign many people will have as their first symptom is a seizure. Whether it is a generalized seizure, you know, where you fall to the ground shaking, bite your tongue, you know, or whether it is a partial seizure where you'll be staring off into space or be distracted or like you may have, you know, chewing movements or whether um, you may suddenly just, you know, have speech arrest and be unfocused or whatever. A seizure is usually one of the first signs. Um, you may have like problems with your memory that are new onset, uh, nausea, vomiting may be, you know, persistent. Uh, one of the things to note about those headaches is usually they're worse in the morning, persistent and onset in that fashion. Um, huh. So, most tumors, they, they are classified histologically. That means by tissue type um, or cellular characteristics. And they're typically graded uh, using the World Health Organization's grading system. You may have heard this, I don't know, you know, on TV or, you know, news or whatever else. Grades one through four. Grades one are the least um, aggressive, least impinging, um, whereas grade four are malignant, fast moving, very destructive and spread. 
uh, quickly. They're the ones that are most lethal and where care tends to be more palliative, where you tend to relieve the patient's symptoms, but they're most fatal. Um, so, so what are the kinds of treatments? I mean, we're doing a, a general overview right now. I do want to make that clear. Um, surgery, that's usually uh, the first thing we're going to reach for, and you'll get a chance to see that later on. Uh, we may do chemo. There are different types of chemo, depending on histo histology, the tissue types, things like that, what it's reactive to, the, what the cancer is reactive to. Um, radiation and immunotherapy. Uh, immunotherapy basically teaches the body cells how to recognize, because that's one of the skills, if you will, of cancer is hiding from the body's immune systems because the way that the cells are changed, the way that the reproductive signaling changes these cells are kind of throwbacks to less mature versions of body cells. And so they're good at hiding from the body's immune system. Um, so, and we're familiar with chemo, which is the use of strong drugs to try and kill off um, these quick, these reproducing cells. Now, here's something to note. Um, cancer cells do not divide more quickly than other body cells. They just keep dividing. They don't stop doing that. Whereas a healthy cell gets a stop signal and knows, hey, stop dividing. Here are neighboring cells. You don't want to impinge on them. But cancer cells just keep dividing regardless of the signal. And this is why tumors are so dangerous because they just don't quit dividing, but they're not faster than other cells at dividing. They just keep going and don't stop. They don't get the red light. They also don't self-destruct. Cancer cells keep going and all cells are supposed to, adult, mature, developed cells are supposed to get a signal that says stop and also if you're broken, destroy yourself. It's called apoptosis, and we've talked about this before. Cancer cells do not get that self-destruct signal. They don't know when to destroy themselves. Um, and because of that, a broken cell will hang around. And again, one of, the, one of our goals with both uh, immune therapy and chemotherapy is to send an appropriate signal to cause a cell to destroy itself or destroy the nucleus completely, and then the cell will then be eaten by the body's immune system if it doesn't receive the proper signal. Um, so our goal is to turn off those and take advantage of the unique characteristics of cancer cells. Um, they are what's called functionally immortal. It doesn't mean they can't die. What it means is they don't die by normal mechanisms, um, by either planned or unintentional senescence, aging of the cell. Um, and these are because of the malfunctions in the genetics. Um, as I said, they impinge on other cells and they don't get the appropriate signal to stop growing. They just keep going. And this is why a tumor, as it grows larger, it increases pressure. And in the brain, we all know what happens when you increase pressure by a growth or something else like that. Your ICP, your intracranial pressure, will rise and that puts you at risk for damage from swelling within you know, brain space. All right. Um... Something else that tumors can do is in, is trigger angiogenesis. And we're talking about uh, triggering um, the growth of blood vessels. Um, and so they can induce the growth of new blood vessels to feed the tumor. There has been some work on medications to inhibit or starve um, cancer cells of their blood supply or their food supply by blocking this growth of new blood vessels. Um, these, these drugs have been eh, helpful as auxiliary medications, but we're still learning more about how to do this. Um, there's no real battery of tests that, that tells us this is absolutely, you know, the no neuropsych kind of testing says this is absolutely the best way to assess for changes caused by, but we're still learning, you know. So there, as, as I said, you know, it's like we're looking for the two types of tumors, which are metastatic versus primary. Um, and so the metastatic types of tumors, those that come from elsewhere in the body are more common in adults, whereas the primary types are more common in kids. But 
it doesn't mean you can't get both at adults and kids. Um, in fact, leukemia is one of the big ones in kids that ends up in the brain. And we'll be looking at some treatment for that. Um, so let's talk about the kinds of tumors in adults. Um, the most common metastases in adults are lung cancer, breast cancer, and melanoma, skin cancer. That's another big one, too. Um, up to almost half of adult patients with uh, non-central nervous system, that is metastatic types, um, will eventually get metastatic brain cancer. Almost half, about 40-45%. So it's something to keep aware of. So And prognosis of how they're going to do is related to the primary site. So wherever this cancer is coming from, so it's important to keep alert. Uh, on how that's doing to tell you eh, likely survival rate. Primary brain tumors coming from the brain itself uh, develop in the tentorium here of the hemispheres. This is usually where you find it in adults coming from. Um, there are different types of primary brain tumors in adults. Gliomas. Uh, glial cells are the support cells. Glia meaning glue. They're the support cells, and there are many different types of glial cells that originate gliomas. Gliomas count for in adults about 80% of all brain tumors that are primary in adults. And unfortunately, their mortality rate is very high, um, partly because they can be fairly silent initially until you're showing the headaches, the seizures, those initial onset symptoms. And so it is important to be aware, um, you know, so now, again, as I was referring back to about how benign, uh, most people assume, oh, the tumor's benign, so it must not be harmful. The thing is, first, benign tumors can flip the switch and become malignant in the brain, can become very quickly aggressive. So it's important to know what you're dealing with, and not only that, to get it removed or treated. You, you shouldn't let it, anything like that sit. Um, and depending on where they are, like if they're near the brainstem, yeah, um, that increased pressure, as I was talking about earlier, even if they're a bit indolent, that is their growth is slow, that pressure near your brainstem can stop your heart, stop your lungs. Malignant types of tumors are, um, you have trouble picking out them, if you're looking under a microscope, they're hard to pick apart. So we use special tools that light up and make them more visible. Here, here is an example. I want to show you a video in a moment um, of one of the ways that surgeons can mark out a glioblastoma when they're removing it. Um, and we use the term anaplastic. Plastic means bendable, malleable, formable. So malignant brain tumors tend to be anaplastic. And so we use this technique which causes them to fluoresce under lights and we uh, attach a, a marker that glows so we can see the margins of the tumor so it can be excised and we cut out. Here, here is um, the use of one of these uh, fluorescing markers in surgery. This is a patient in their mid-50s who presents with acute onset, severe headache, and a transient episode of confusion and aphasia. Magnetic resonance imaging revealed a right-sided temporal parietal lesion with characteristics consistent with glioma. The patient was neurologically intact. Here is preoperative imaging showing a ring-enhancing lesion with an area of central necrosis. This is a list of risks and benefits of the procedure. However, this is not all-inclusive. Alternatives were biopsy and radiation alone. This is not a reasonable alternative as the extent of resection of glioblastoma has been correlated with length of survival. Thus, in the absence of external limiting factors, resection should be considered paramount. The patient was positioned laterally on the left side with the head turned toward the left to allow adequate access to the right parietal region. Necessary equipment included 5 amino lebulinic acid administered 2 to 4 hours prior to anesthesia, a standard craniotomy and microsurgical set, as well as an operating microscope with a blue emitting light source. Key steps include craniotomy, cordisectomy, resection of tumor, and closure. Here is a still image following craniotomy and opening of the dura.
At this point, a cortisectomy is performed as well as resection of obvious tumor tissue under white light. Once significant resection of the obvious tissue is accomplished, blue light is turned on and you can see the bright pink fluorescence of the 5-aminolebulinic acid. It is important to switch back and forth between blue and white light to identify blood vessels as well as small areas of bleeding and to obtain adequate hemostasis. Importantly, under the blue light, it is sometimes easy to become disoriented and therefore it is pertinent to switch back to the white light in order to assist with spatial awareness. You can see here we are resecting additional areas of obvious tumor tissue as well as obtaining adequate hemostasis. Switching back to the blue light assists in resecting the edges of the enhancing tissues that were previously observed on magnetic resonance imaging. Also note that blood within the cavity will reflect green and areas of normal white matter will reflect with a bluish hue. It is important to be able to recognize this bluish hue from the light pink areas of the 5-aminolebulinic acid. Additionally, it is also important to obtain adequate hemostasis under white light. As you can see here, blood in the cavity will obscure the bright pink fluorescence of the 5-aminolebulinic acid with the green fluorescence noted previously. Here is a view of the operative cavity once gross total resection has been accomplished. Note the bluish hue of the blue reflectance off the white matter as well as the green reflectance of the blood in the cavity. Looking under white light allows us to achieve a final view of the operative cavity and here is a final view of the operative cavity under the blue light showing the blue reflectance. Glioblastoma is the most common and lethal astrocytoma of which there are three subtypes IDH wild type, IDH mutant, and not otherwise specified. Imaging characteristics are typically a peripherally enhancing tumor with a hypo-intense necrotic core, and studies have shown that a resection of greater than 97% has a significant survival benefit. This and the next two slides show the axial, coronal, and sagittal post-op imaging with and without contrast, showing gross total resection of the tumor with T1 with and without contrast imaging matching consistent with blood and surgical cell within the cavity. The patient was observed in the intensive care unit overnight with no peri or post-operative complications. They were then discharged home on post-operative day three with an intact neurological exam. All right, so, you know, that that is one of the ways in which we can find them. Because in the past, you couldn't really necessarily find, because of the nature of malignant brain tumors, find these as easily and take them out. Whereas with the more benign type, the margins were clear and it was easier to cut them out. And the problem with the more malignant type, and when you were excising these tumors as a surgeon, you would do damage to healthy areas and you would leave the patient with more disabilities, or you'd have to rely on like whole brain irradiation, which causes a whole other set of problems. Um, and when we're talking about malignant, I again want to stress that what we're talking about, um, how aggressive the tumor is, not how likely it is to spread, because most brain tumors do not spread like that, okay? They just grow more quickly in the brain. They usually do not leave the central nervous system. They remain within the brain, again, because of the blood-brain barrier crossing over, that kind of thing. Um, but it means they're fast movers. All right. Um, usually, malignant brain tumors are caused by many changes in gene expressions. 
Um, it seems as though the genes most usually involved are either the P53 um, gene located on the 17P chromosome. Seems to be one of those switches. And it's important to keep in mind, as I was talking about genetics, uh, an interplay between oncogenes, which promote reproductive growth and cancer growth versus tumors or cancer suppressor genes, which are, is that kind of genetic interaction to control cellular reproduction and diseases and illnesses that I was talking about may flip those switches. So it's important to keep in mind the complexity of, of dealing with this. Um, so what are the types of malignant tumors. They are, for example, anaplastic, astrocytoma, glioblastoma, multiform. That one's fairly common, unfortunately. Um, oligodendrocytoma, um, medulloblastoma, and pineoblastoma. Those are some of the malignant types. Um, the peak incidence of brain tumors in a person is in their 70s and 80s. Um, malignant brain tumors only count for about 1.5%, 2% of all cancer-related deaths. The average age where you start to see first hints is in your mid-50s, early 60s, in that age range. You start to see suggestions that something's up. And here's something important to keep in mind. Those of us with traumatic brain injury are at an increased risk of brain tumors because of traumatic brain injury. Remember how I said about coding? Um, so that is also. Um, 3.7 out of 100,000 people who are, or men will show these symptoms and about 2.5 to 2.7 out of 100,000 women will have a primary brain tumor. Um, in that range. Uh, so you know, so what are signs and symptoms generally? Um, as I said, headaches um, are a common sign. Seizures are a big one. Rise in intracranial pressure gives different signs. Uh, growth in the temporal area mm, can cause auditory and deficits, can cause problems with hearing or perception of like sounds, music, and pressing into frontal areas. You may have problems with speech, aphasia, um, new onset, um, problems with understanding language. Um, but headache is really the big one. That would be the one that jumps out. Um, especially the early or late kind of, you know, uh, hmm. they're described as non pulsatile So they do not feel like the kind of migraine kind of headaches. Um, they may resemble migraine or tension in that there's an extreme kind of pressing sensation here or here. Um, they're bilateral. Um, uh, if they're localized, they generally tend to be on the same side as the tumor. But it's not common to have them be unilateral. They more typically are on or bilateral. Uh, <sighs> As I said, seizures, fairly common. Vertigo, fatigue, so dizziness, feeling the neural fatigue is common. Cognitive problems, thinking, planning, organizing. Um, loss of appetite, personality change, um, especially associated with frontal lobe tumors. We all know, you know, increase in apathy, um, abulia, the adynamia, kind of new onset. Contralateral motor weakness. So if you have the tumor here, weakness with your opposite hand, um, speech effects, visual perceptual problems, problems with either not seeing clearly or having mild low level hallucinations or distortions, illusions, distortions of things that are there, mm, hearing sounds, you know, or distorted. Um, Tumors in the thalamus causing cognitive impairment, hemiparesis, so half the body paralyzed, um, ataxia, memory problems, which can get progressively worse. Um, so 
you know, these are some of the different kinds of... There's also another side effect, uh, paraneoplastic syndromes, which are an autoimmune reaction to cancer. So your body trying to attack it, but affecting other systems as well. Um, things like, you know, you somebody may show like, you know, encephalitis or something that resembles that. Um, optic neuritis, so inflammation of your optic nerves, your vision may be affected. And your body would show inflammatory markers from a blood test. Um, cerebellar degeneration, so imaging of the cerebellum would show that the cerebellum is atrophied. And the thing is, of course, obviously would show the brain tumor. I mean, here's a glioblastoma, frontal glioblastoma on imaging. Um, peripheral nerves, you may have neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, Guillain-Barre, French polio, uh, neuromuscular problems, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, myasthenia gravis, um, I don't know, um, any kind of peripheral nervous system problems. These all look like separate diseases, but they're not. They are related to inflammatory markers and factors associated with the autoimmune markers trying to attack a tumor, which is your own cells, and the body's not quite sure to do with these things. So, well, so let's talk about, you know, the kind of imaging. Um, so, CT, MRI, CT scan, brain tumor. They're obvious, they're more clear. Even things that may be hard to detect um, when doing direct surgery. Hmm. MRI. So, these are fairly straightforward to, the thing is that a definitive diagnosis may require brain tissue biopsy, but if you're going to, especially if you're going to try to grade it, because you need to take a look at the tissue under uh, a microscope and you need to classify and grade it. Um, high grade tumors, grade four, grade three, which are malignant, fast growing, um, invasive, they're more likely to recur even with treatment. And unfortunately, due to the difficulty of curing them, much of the treatment tends to be palliative, that is trying to relieve the symptoms. And unfortunately, hmm. so, you know, um, grade four tumors, high, high grade, they're malignant, they're rapidly growing, they have a high degree of infiltration, they're not encapsulated. Uh, so they're not wrapped around by other tissue that would contain them. Uh, not wrapped by a glial or um, dural matter or anything like that, which might contain them. So they're going to grow quickly and spread more quickly. Grade 3, which is also considered a high-grade uh, tumor. Uh, high-grade, they're malignant, rapid-growing, high infiltration. They're poorly encapsulated. They may be encapsulated, so they're easier to remove, but not well. Then the low-grade tumors, which are grades 1 and 2, um, grade 2, low-grade malignant tumor, slow-growing, low infiltration, potential being encapsulated, and they have poorly defined borders, though, so again, hard to remove, but they are definable, and they have a greater potential for removal, but they are... Hmm. Finally, grade one or low-grade tumors. They're slow-growing, low infiltration, so they haven't pushed into other tissues as much. Um, the borders are clear. They're encapsulated, and they don't recur, or tend not to recur, okay? Um, this is what the biopsy is good for. Uh, the whole point of the World Health Organization's grading system is to make predictions uh, about them. So let's talk about the different... Uh, kinds of treatment. Um, when you're dealing with a grade one tumor, truly you're trying to cure it. Even with a grade two, you're trying to cure it. 
not just go for a remission, but you're trying to cure it, get rid of it completely. Um, especially for primary tumors, because you have them isolated. Uh, grades three, grade four, grade three, grade three is more about um, remission, trying to keep it from coming back, but knowing there's good chance you'll see a return. Grade four is palliative, uh, mainly, and trying to keep the patient comfortable. Do extraordinary things happen? Yes. But for the most part, trying to make the patient comfortable because usually they've, they're have they well infiltrated, they're very aggressive, and survival rate can vary. Um, when you're dealing with things like the grade four, you're talking about, you know, uh, well, specifically, I'm going to look here, grade four, you're dealing with uh, especially things like gliomas. Um, Grade four, you're dealing with survival rate of one year, maybe one and a half. Grades three, you're dealing with about two to three years of survival. Grade two, about 10. And that's because of all the other risk factors too. Grade one, grade two, those are series you're talking about curative. So, you know, normal lifespan if depending on how things go. All right, let's talk about surgery. Um, the first treatment, anyone will try is neurosurgery. Try to get that tumor out. You saw a short clip um, of a of neurosurgery for a glioma, that glio, glioblastoma multiform, which is a highly aggressive tumor using a fluorescing marker. You saw that. Now I want to show you a... A surgery where, well, they're removing a grade one tumor. And the thing to know about a lot of, and this is more of a more benign type of tumor they're removing, a benign tumor. Um, and the goal here is curative. Remove the whole thing and the patient can go back to their life just with periodic monitoring to make sure there were no malignant cells left behind. Hello, my name is Dr. Jugal Shah, and I'm a neurosurgeon at MedStar Franklin Square. Today I'm going to be showing you a video of a meningioma resection. The patient is a 53-year-old woman, part-time model, who came in with several months of speech and word-finding difficulty. She also noticed a bump growing underneath her scalp behind her left forehead. She got an MRI, which demonstrated a tumor growing from the covering of her brain and also extending outward underneath her scalp. We suspected it was a benign tumor called a meningioma, and given the swelling and the symptoms that it was causing, surgical treatment was indicated. So this patient had a growth on the left side of her skull, just behind the hairline, and you can see here, planning the incision, uh, the patient had a uh, part-time job as a model, so her appearance uh, post-operatively was very important to her. So here I am planning the incision, making sure that it stays completely behind the hairline, and you can see me prepping there. I'm now making the incision uh, through the scalp and using electrocautery to gently cauterize the tissue as I make my way down to the skull. In order to control bleeding from the skull, we use this device here, uh, which is called a rainy clip applier, and that gently clamps down the vessels that feed the skull and preserves them without necessarily having to completely cauterize them in order to preserve the tissue and improve the postoperative appearance. Next, I'm using what's called a periosteal elevator, which is specifically designed to strip the connective soft tissue overlying the skull as I reflect the scalp forward. 
as I'm reflecting the periosteal forward, you can see the part of the tumor that was coming out of her skull and resulting in a raised bump on her forehead come into view right there. This made the surgical planning a little bit more straightforward as even before I did any incision through the bone, I could see exactly where the tumor was. And here I'm using the periosteal to sweep forward the connective soft tissue in order to get completely in front of the tumor, even though I was preventing any incision from going onto her forehead. Here I'm using a sponge in order to reflect the scalp forward and keep it healthy during the tumor resection. Here I'm using a self-retaining retractor to maintain my view during the next parts of the surgery. Just clearing off any residual soft tissue here as the entirety of the external part of the tumor comes into view. I wanted to ensure that I got all of the tumor out, so here I'm using the bovi electric artery to mark the space around the tumor where I'm planning on completely removing the bone. And sometimes during meningioma surgery, the bone flap is replaced. In this case, because the tumor was invading in and through the bone from the beginning, I planned on removing it. Here what I'm placing is what's called a burr hole in which a special, special clutch mechanism drill is used to create a hole within the bone. It's usual for these meningiomas with bone to induce its own blood supply, and thus you see some bleeding, which is quickly controlled. Next, I'm using the craniotome, which is a drill designed to cut through the bone safely while preserving the covering to the brain, which is the dura underneath. You can see the skull flap pulsating as the pressure is starting to be released from outside of the tumor. Just as the skull was highly vascular and bloody, the dura itself, where the tumor is residing, is vascular. And here I'm using bipolar electric cautery to slow down and control any bleeding before I proceed forward. Here, a hemostatic agent is used to control any bleeding around the edges of the skull defect. I'm using the intraoperative ultrasound to ensure that the tumor is contained entirely within the defect that I've created. Next, since I'm planning on excising the entire dura from which the tumor is arising, I'm using what's called pot scissors to incise the dura and develop a plane circumferentially completely around the tumor. The important thing during this part is to preserve any blood vessels that supply the brain might be closely underneath the dura to avoid inadvertently resulting in injury. So I use a cottonoid patty to preserve that plane. Because the tumor itself was vascular, it was inducing its own blood supply from the dura. So we can see that uh, compared to normal dura, it's highly vascular. Now that the durus on the surface of the tumor has been completely circumferentially cut, the next part of the surgery is to separate the tumor from the brain tissue underneath. Here what I'm doing is I'm applying gentle traction and suction to develop a plane between the surface of the tumor and the surface of the brain, I knew from the preoperative MRI that the surrounding part of the tumor was going to have a relatively good plane, but the deeper parts of the tumor 
appear to be more intertwined with the normal brain. So here I'm using bipolar electrocautery to carefully coagulate any blood vessels that are invading into the tumor and to further help develop the plane between the brain tumor and the brain surface interface. After I coagulate it, I use micro scissors to cut within that plane and continue to develop it as I carefully separate the tumor from the brain. Here I'm continuing to develop this plane all the way around the tumor when there are parts of the tumor that are indistinguishable from the normal brain. I then go to another part of the tumor where the plane is more distinguishable and continue to develop it until I'm able to create a nice gentle separation. We can see the deepest parts of the tumor, as I mentioned earlier, were nearly indistinguishable from normal brain. So again, I am carefully developing that plane, carefully cutting the attachments to the brain as I'm able to create a separation plane between the normal brain and the tumor. After that detachment there, you can see that plane continuing to develop very nicely. Here I'm working underneath the edge of the surface to make sure all bleeding is under control. At this point, all of the tumor has been removed and we're making sure there's no residual bleeding blood vessels or any raw surfaces of the brain. I'm placing what's called Surgicel, which is a hemostatic agent designed to create a chemical reaction and prevent any bleeding afterwards. And because I removed a generous portion of the dura from which the tumor was arising. Here I'm using the bone flap to measure out a dural graft substitute. This is a biosynthetic material that is designed to replace the function of the dura. I use the removed bone flap as a measurement and I cut the corresponding size of the dural replacement to size. Here I'm carefully suturing a patch of that dural replacement onto where the previous dura previously existed. I'm carefully suturing a watertight closure. Here you see the final product after the dural graft substitute has been sutured onto the gap in the dura. You can see that there's a watertight closure. Because we are also removing a part of the skull, we will need to replace that with a substitute. In this case, we're using a titanium mesh, which again, I'm measuring and cutting to the appropriate size. Next, I'm affixing the titanium mesh to the skull using titanium plates in order to achieve an even contour and to protect the brain underneath.
Next, we're carefully controlling any bleeding as we reapproximate the scalp back together in layers. Once I remove the tumor, not only in the beginning did we send a piece off to the pathologist to get a frozen specimen, which gave us an early indication that this was indeed a meningioma, as we suspected on the MRI. Once the entire tumor is removed, it's sent to pathology to obtain a final pathological diagnosis and staging, which will determine what treatment is necessary afterwards. Fortunately, in the case of this patient, it ended up being a grade one, which is the most benign version of this meningioma, in which case routine postoperative radiation or chemotherapy is not necessarily uh, is not necessary unless uh, as long as all of the tumor is removed. The surgery took place over about three hours in the operating room, and the patient was sent home the next day. All right, so that was that's an interesting procedure there, and you saw with the surgeon like how he was also trying to protect the patient's livelihood, um, because it's important in these cases where there's hope for a complete cure for this that you take it all out and that you leave intact. And in her case, because she's also a model as well, she wants to you know so. Surgical resections and debulking of the tumor are common. Um, resection is removal of the tumor for curative purposes. So if you hear the magic word resection, they are trying to cut it all out. Um, whereas debulking is taking out as much as they can, but knowing you're leaving some behind. But a resection is an attempt to remove the whole thing. And again, it depends how aggressive it is, whether they can get to it. Uh, if it's near the brainstem or something else, they may not be able to get it all. Then they'll have to use other techniques. Okay. Also, uh, beyond that, um, and if it's a resection, a complete resection, then a more favorable prognosis and less likely to have to use other modes of treatment. Next, we'll talk about radiation therapy. Now, we've discussed with talking about radiation exposure, brain injury, stuff like that. You have different choices. You've got particle therapy and photon. Therapy. Now, photon therapy talks about using X-rays and gamma rays, high-energy photons, to denature the proteins inside the nucleus of the cell to destroy the cell's nucleus, so the cancer cell can no longer reproduce. Now, the problem, of course, with that is that you're going to destroy healthy cells too. But we're getting better at targeting just the bad cells, low enough doses that converge on the cancer. Here is an example of the use of um, the, uh, the gamma knife. The brain is the most precious organ in the human body. Driving and managing the functions of the body, as well as being a repository for memories and personality. Treatment of diseases in the brain can significantly impact patients' quality of life. Lexal Gamma Knife Radio Surgery is specifically designed to minimize that impact. Lexel Gamma Knife is providing a gentler, non-invasive alternative to traditional brain surgery and a more targeted approach than conventional radiotherapy. Lexel Gamma Knife uses 192 precisely focused beams of radiation to treat tumors or other abnormalities in the brain. The radiation beams are precisely focused to intersect at a single point called the isocenter. This is accurately positioned within the clinical target to achieve a maximum dose to the target while ensuring minimal dose to healthy tissues. Lexel Gamma Knife Radio Surgery uses ionizing radiation to damage the deceased tissue beyond repair by disrupting the DNA structure in the cells. 
The type of radiation used in Lexel Gamma Knife is gamma radiation emitted from a radioactive isotope of cobalt known as cobalt-60. Because each cobalt source is very small, only one millimeter in diameter, and close to the target in the patient's brain, it provides superb precision for brain radiosurgery. Tungsten and lead shielding prevents unintended transmission of radiation and ensures the safety of patients and hospital personnel. The cobalt sources are arranged into eight movable sectors inside the radiation unit surrounding the patient. A sophisticated beam shaping system with fixed channels, called collimators, is used to create narrow beams of radiation, all precisely focused to intersect at the planned isocenter. The size of the beams can be adjusted by independently moving the sources in each sector to one of four available collimator positions, creating beams of 4 mm, 8 mm or 16 mm in diameter. When treatment is paused or completed, the sources are moved into a shielded position, the closed collimator position. Lexel Gamma Plan Treatment Planning System generates the dose plan using a highly sophisticated software that can create the plan at lightning speed. When performing radiosurgery in the brain, it is important to prevent any movement of the patient's head. A frame or a mask system is used for this purpose, ensuring that the planned treatment is delivered accurately. An integrated ultra-low dose cone beam CT imaging system is used to verify the patient position and adapt the treatment plan at the time of treatment. The treatment plan is automatically adapted to the target position by co-registration of pre-treatment cone beam CT images to reference images. Dose evaluation allows for online review of the delivery adaptation so that the planned dose distribution is delivered as intended. Now the treatment can begin. During treatment delivery, the patient position is automatically adjusted to new isocenter positions and the collimator sizes are changed without the need for any user interactions. The shape of the beam is adjusted and by placing multiple isocenters within the target, the dose is built up to tightly conform to the target shape. The infrared high-definition motion management system tracks the patient movement using markers on the patient's nose to monitor movement of the patient during treatment in real time. Should the patient inadvertently move during the treatment delivery, the system ensures that the treatment is automatically paused. Once the treatment is completed, the collimator returns to the closed position. The patient is automatically moved from the treatment position and the shielding doors are closed. All these functions are a part of a seamless integrated system created for end-to-end -end ease of use. Patients are usually in and out of hospital in one day and back to normal routines shortly after their treatment. Confident that the precision of Lexel Gamma Knife has helped to preserve the essence of who they are by safeguarding their neurocognitive function and memories. Lexel Gamma Knife delivers expertise and precision where patients need it most. To treat brain tumor, which uses cobalt 60, uh, which produces gamma rays, in order to destroy a tumor. This device, like I said, uses photons, and they can also use the cyber knife, just here, um, which produces x-rays. Same kind of technique, same kind of thinking, in order to destroy uh, cancer cells, brain cancer cells. Um, this is often used in combination with chemo and surgery, especially for a more malignant type of brain tumor. 
The problem is, of course, again, destruction of healthy cells. Um, we're trying to destroy the nucleus of these altered cells. They're slightly more vulnerable to radiation because they don't function. And more importantly, they're dividing. And cells that are dividing are using their nuclei. They have the uh, genes opened up for reproduction. And so forming these dimers, which is basically how um, elements of the, of the genes stick together. I'm not going to get into that, but we talked about it. And the formation of oxygen-free radicals, which also cause genes to misstick. And you also apply the energy to cause proteins to denature, to kind of wrinkle up into misfolded forms and cause a cell to die because of all this damaging, the damaging energy supply plus the formation of oxygen-free radicals. And these things are destructive to the cell and it causes it to cease functioning. And then the immune system will get rid of these. But the problem is it also kills healthy cells. Now, what about particle therapy? You may have heard of the use of proton therapy, which basically is similar in that you are trying to destroy reproducing cells. And the goal to just, the, the thing is with destroying reproducing cells is you affect digestive tract cells, you affect um, like cells in the mouth, you affect cells in the esophagus, you know, you affect um Anywhere that is skin cells, cells that are healthy that are needed to reproduce more frequently. And so uh, your blood cells and things like that. And this is why you get the symptoms you do from radiation or chemo or whatever else. Because both radiation and chemo cause, you know, side effects that are related to the fact that radiation or particle therapy destroys healthy dividing cells too. And that's where you get the GI effects, the nausea, the vomiting. You get sometimes get the bleeding and you get, you know, like infections and stuff because you're losing your healthy immune cells as well because they're dividers as well. All right. So proton therapy is throwing a, well, a hydrogen atom is nothing more than an electron in orbit around a proton. Strip off the hydrogen atom and accelerate use a, uh, an electromagnet to throw a proton around really fast and toss it at many, many of them, not a single one, but many, many, many of these at the nuclei of the genes and cause them to stick and denature and form the free, free oxygen radical stuff. The thing is you can control them much more precisely, much more precisely as particles. Um, and they have a density. They're heavy. Um, you can use them directed and they'll smash into, relatively speaking, I mean, it's an atom. Let's face it. Heavy for an atom is, you know, a relative kind of concept. Anyway, you can smash these things in. Well, here, here's a video. I've made lots of videos on tons of topics, covering the quarks to the cosmos, so to speak. In this video, I thought I'd tell you something that's way more down to earth. I thought I'd tell you about something about a specific kind of radiation therapy called proton radiation therapy. Now, before I do that, I should remind you that I'm not a doctor. Well, I am, but as my somewhat curmudgeonly Aunt Margaret will often remind me. Not the kind of doctor that's good for anything. Personally, I think that's a bit unfair because physics is at least as cool as medicine. But she does have a point. I'm not an MD. Oh, yeah. Goodbye, Aunt Margaret. So don't think that I'm offering useful medical advice because I'm not. And I'm probably too expensive for you anyway. Now, I don't want to make light of cancer. It's a serious thing. I've lost people I care about to it. And when we're talking about it in a real world situation, it's very, very, very complicated. But since I'm not the useful kind of doctor, I can simplify things. Depending on whether a cancer is localized or spread out and intermixed with ordinary tissue, the real kinds of doctors will operate to try to remove the tumor or do chemotherapy or maybe use radiation to try to kill the tumor. So let's talk about the radiation option. 
Traditionally, doctors used gamma radiation to try to kill the tumor. I made a video on the various kinds of radiation if you're interested in what that means, but briefly, gamma rays have no electrical charge and can penetrate deeply into the body. They're like x-rays, bigger and tougher brother. Now, let's suppose we have some sort of tumor that is small and compact, say the size of a marble or so. Let's also say that it is buried deep inside the brain. Because of its location, it might well be inoperable. Chemotherapy might work, but if it's compact, it might be amenable to using radiation therapy. So I'm going to talk about proton therapy, but to understand why it's an interesting approach, I need to talk a little bit about conventional radiation therapy and its limitations. So how does it work? Well, to begin with, conventional radiation is emitted by the source of gamma radiation, and it hits the surface of your head. But what happens as the radiation passes through the tissues of your head? The way it works is that the tissue near the surface of your head gets the full rate of radiation, and it absorbs some. As the beam goes deeper, the next layer also absorbs some radiation, but less than the surface. That's because the surface has already absorbed a bit of it. When the beam arrives at the tumor, it's already been partially absorbed by the layers closer to the surface. That means that the surface tissue gets more damage than the tumor itself. And, of course, the beam doesn't just stop at the tumor. It continues on through the brain, and some of it might even come out of the other side of your head. The brain tissue after the tumor gets a reduced dose of radiation, but it still gets some. This picture really illustrates what's going on. The darker color means more radiation absorption. The healthy surface tissue gets the most dose and therefore is most likely to be damaged. So that sounds kind of awful. The cancer only gets part of the radiation dose and healthy tissue gets more than the cancer does. So how do doctors handle this? Well, the way they do that is they move you or the beam so the beam goes through a different path through your head. That way, one treatment hits one spot on your head surface, while the next treatment goes through another. However, every treatment goes through the tumor. Over the course of multiple treatments, the tumor gets hit again and again, with the other tissues getting hit only once. The goal is that the accumulative dose in the tumor is higher than the other tissues receive. It's actually quite clever. Now, what about proton therapy? How does that work? Well, unlike gamma rays, Protons have electrical charge. They're also heavy, at least as far as subatomic particles go. And when they pass through matter, they lose their energy fairly slowly for most of the passage, but then lose a whole bunch just at the end. This is called the Bragg peak, if you want to look it up. It's kind of like when you're slowing your car down for a stop sign. It's smooth going until the moment when the car actually stops, and then the back of the car settles down and you get a bit of a jerk. We can see in this image what this means in terms of energy dose. Here, the surface tissues receive a lower dose than the tumor does, and further, the beam doesn't continue on through the head. So this sounds like a great approach. And, of course, you can do the trick of shooting the beam at the tumor at different angles. This means it's possible to hit the deep tumor hard with much less damage to the surrounding tissue. Now, proton therapy isn't a new idea. The first paper on the subject was written by Robert Wilson in 1946 when he was developing a cyclotron accelerator at Harvard. Robert Wilson also built Fermilab, the laboratory at which I am a scientist. Wilson was like totally the bomb. The Harvard cyclotron collaborated with Massachusetts General Hospital and developed the technology for over the next 40 years or so. The first commercial and hospital-based facility began in 1989 at the Clatterbridge Center for Oncology in the UK, followed by one at the Loma Linda University Medical Center in 1990. That particular accelerator was built at my own Fermilab, and one of my fellow graduate students moved there to operate it. Small world. Proton therapy centers are becoming common around the world. In fact, there is one just a few miles from Fermilab. I've even used it to irradiate electronics to see if they would work in a high radiation environment. Now, I want to remind you that I'm not an MD and I'm not a radiation therapy specialist, so don't take any of what I said as medical advice. 
For that, you need to talk to a real oncologist or radiation expert, specifically one of those kind of doctors who actually is useful. Proton therapy is really pretty cool. It causes less damage to surrounding tissue than conventional gamma ray radiation, and it's becoming useful to treat a variety of tumors. While I hope that neither you nor anyone you care about ever gets cancer, it unfortunately does happen sometimes. If you are in that awful situation, maybe it makes sense to, like the television medical commercials say, ask your doctor if proton therapy is right for you. So like Aunt Margaret said, I'm not the best source of medical advice, but the underlying physics is really super interesting. If you liked the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Let's get those numbers up. And let me know what you think in the comments. See you next time and keep on physicsing. It explains a lot better than I did. So there you go. Um, but, you know, that, that is how proton therapy works. And it's similar to the use of x-rays or gamma rays to destroy tumors. It's the same wherever in the body is, but it's an effective method. Finally, chemo. Chemo is the same idea as behind, um, but it's more systematic. And generally it's used to treat other tumors, not primary in the brain, but it is used to treat um, the, the tumors that are malignant throughout the body and to cause the same kind of effects, denaturing of the proteins and cause them to die off. And, you know, it's for the same, same idea. Kill them off. And very few easily penetrate the blood-brain barrier. And so many times I'll have to give them into the spine. They'll have to uh, inject certain ones like methotrexate for example into the spine i want to show you a uh, a young lady getting because she has leukemia she's getting her chemo to help her brain to help take care of any growth in her brain injected into her spine here
Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Are you still happy on your insides, Maddie? Because <laughs> it's over? It can't be over. It's over. It can't be over. <laughs> Was it too fast? Okay, that's chemo for in the spine. Obviously, it hurts. It's very uncomfortable for her, of course. Um, even with deadening the area of her back and, you know, putting in. But that's how it has to be administered, unfortunately. Especially for um, if you're trying to catch any past the blood-brain barrier. It circulates through the cerebrospinal fluid and reaches those areas of the brain. Now, the important thing is like in kids and this type of um, cancer that is metastatic in nature tends to target the dura matter. So the coverings of the brain, not the deeper brain tissue like the primary, but secondary targets the coverings around the brain, which is why it's often given what's called intrathecally. They inject it into the cerebrospinal. It's given as part of the looking for how she's doing through the spinal tap, but also injecting it like that. Um, unfortunately, methotrexate and many chemotherapeutic agents, like doxorubicin, for example, that's another one that unfortunately causes neurological disabilities, causes brain damage, cognitive impairment, may lower the IQ, um, does a bunch of other things. But when your choice is between death versus neurological impairment, I mean, what choice is there, really? Um, you, you, can't let, you, you can't just say, oh, well, we'll just let them die because I don't want to risk that they may have some cognitive problems. I mean, and this is true for radiation or for proton therapy or for, you know, even surgery. Because cutting at a chunk of your brain, it won't do favors for your cognition either, um, clearly. I mean, that should be obvious, but, you know, I, yeah. Um, obviously, having a tumor in your brain doesn't do any favors for your intelligence or cognition or thinking either. Um, so, damned if you do, damned if you don't, perhaps. Um, in any case, um, it is important to consider. So, you know... Um, what kind of effects from chemo? Well, you can have problems with motor functioning, uh, executive functioning, visual spatial functioning. You can have problems with processing speed, verbal memory, attention, focus, coordination, um, behavioral, emotional, everything you would expect. What kind of problems can you have from the tumor? Well, in the end, the main difference is it can kill you. So, again... It's like same same kind of issues with you know using the gamma knife or stereotactic radio surgery of any kind, and I do have a video where we talk about that. Um, so honestly, this is this is difficult because of the complexity of of this topic. Um, brain cancer is uh, very variable in the effects it can cause and in long-term outcome. You really need to know what you're dealing with. Some types of brain cancer are aggressive, fast-moving, the grade fours. It's just like any other kind of cancer, and you really don't have much time. Um, and the best you could do is relieve suffering. Other types of cancer, you've got time, and you, the goal is to cure you. But you first have to know what you're dealing with. And 
that's just a simple truth. And honestly, that's the same with a lot of other forms of acquired brain injury. There is growing hope. And I want to talk quickly about this. Immune therapy. Immune therapy is an attempt, in more detail, to take advantage of some of the unique aspects of cancer in general. Um, because the markers on its surface are different, are intended to hide itself in some way from the immune system, we are working through immune therapy to help the body identify those unique attributes. We are also trying to use viruses programmed to either outright destroy or help the immune system recognize what cancer cells look like, train them to be attack dogs. And specifically, things like, you know, um, CAART, um, things like use of, again, um, adenoviruses, the polio virus, other things like that, which have an affinity for uh, nerve cells, um, to kill specific types of cells that display these unique markers. They've shown promise. Some people are surviving glioblastomas when the survivor rate, aggressive ones, metastatic types, when the survivor rate should be a year, year and a half, are surviving for 10 years, 15. The thing is, we need to understand more and research is ongoing with these kinds of treatments because many tumors have different kinds of markers on their surface in different places because they're gene struck, because they have different genes. Each part, part of the tumor has different genes. So when a treatment kind of works, but not completely, part of it is because its genome is different in different sections of the tumor. So what works for one part doesn't work for another part because its genetics is different. Defeating the cancers will require us to master genetics. We're working on it, but we still have a way to go. These treatments, um, and of course the cancer itself, requires an in-depth knowledge of control, growth, of cells and a fundamental understanding of the microcellular machinery inside a cell. It requires, you know, a, a, a growth of what we've been learning. Um, since the late 90s, early 2000s, we've made some tremendous strides forward. This isn't your grandma's or grandpa's chemo anymore. Uh, Immunotherapy is rapidly becoming the gold standard along with surgery. Um, there's a lot of promise, but unfortunately, the, the, it, it seems like still more time is needed to make more inroads. And that is the one thing that, you know, that all of us struggle with. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next 10 years. And many people don't have another 10 years, but... I foresee a lot of transformation. I mean, I've seen in the last five years in uh, reading and research some incredible things, but I think immunotherapy and gene therapy are definitely, obviously, the future. But uh, So that's just a brief overview of uh, the essentials of acquired brain injury, brain cancer, neoplasm, and uh, some of the treatments and some of the effects. Hope you found it useful. Have a good day. Bye.